Hi guys, it's me Chazor HD and welcome to the 6th episode of the podcast reviewing the first Grand Prix after the summer break, the 2024 Dutch Grand Prix. Apologies by the way that I couldn't get this episode out um, the night of the Grand Prix happening, but uh, yeah, I did actually fall asleep during the Grand Prix. I did watch the first half of it, but in the second half of it there wasn't really a lot going on, so yeah, I did actually fall asleep, but... Let's get into what happened in this Dutch Grand Prix. A Grand Prix that, given we had no safety cars, not even a yellow flag, I don't believe, during the Grand Prix, it was as good as it was going to be at that track. It's very hard to overtake there with these very wide cars. Um, It's a very narrow circuit and tight circuit. And it was a a decent race, I'd say probably a 6 out of 10. Um, we got a overtake, genuine overtake for the lead, which was surprising because when I saw the start of the race, I thought probably that would be it in terms of who was going to win. But as we'll get on to, the pace of the winning team and driver was incredible in that Dutch Grand Prix. But let's just go through the top 10 uh, finishers. Lando Norris wins the Dutch Grand Prix as really he should have um, his pace combined with the pace of the McLaren was unbelievable during the race weekend. Uh, uh, probably one of the best pole positions of the year we saw on the Saturday. And then on Sunday, despite losing the lead at the start, once he got past Verstappen, what a performance it was after that. And then Max Verstappen ended up in second, almost 23 seconds behind we'll get into Red Bull later on of course and then very surprisingly Charles Leclerc third absolutely nobody predicted that to happen especially after Friday where they looked like they were more of a midfield team and even after qualifying where they qualified I think what was it sixth and 11th with both cars, I don't think anyone thought, even Ferrari fans, that a podium really was possible. But Leclerc, unbelievable uh, performance. And for me, Leclerc, driver of the day. Uh, and we'll get into why I think he was driver of the day later on. And then fourth, Oscar Piastri. Fifth, Carlos Sainz. Great drive from Carlos Sainz from uh, P11 or P10 it was actually on the grid. And then... Perez in 6th, Russell 7th, Hamilton 8th, Pierre Gasly in ninth, and Fernando Alonso, disappointing race for him and Aston Martin, finishing up in P10. But let's get into the race winners themselves, uh, McLaren. What a weekend for them. Qualifying, their pace was absolutely stunning. Of course, they brought a big upgrade package for this weekend, the biggest upgrade package um, that they have brought since Miami, and clearly it has worked because it is clear to see now around medium or high downforce circuits, McLaren clearly from now on until the end of the season have got the best car around those types of circuits. They were miles quicker than everybody else without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, yeah, an incredible performance in qualifying, and then in the race. I have to say, for Lando Norris, you know, lost the lead at the start. I mean, social media was blowing up at the start, uh, obviously, you know, taking the piss out of him because once again, he lost the lead on the first lap. But I have to respect his performance after that where, you know, he didn't go making mistakes. He didn't have a great first few laps. Max's pace was pretty good, but then he, you know, calmed down and got into the groove And then slowly but surely caught Max up. And then once he got in the DRS of Max, very quickly caught Max. And with a brilliant overtake at turn one, got into the lead. And once Max was dropped out of DRS, um, Lando destroyed Max Verstappen. And again, the car is a big reason why that was the case um it's not all down to lando norris why he won the race by such a big margin but a a really really good performance from lando to again after what happened at the start where he had a really poor start very lucky 
that the run down to turn one wasn't that long because if it was a lot longer, Lando could have lost maybe another position because he got a lot of wheel spin off the line, did Lando. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, he calmed down, got in the groove, got past Verstappen, and then just relentlessly pulled away. McLaren's pace was stupendous. It really, really was. And that's a, a great term, really, uh, or word to use to describe just how good McLaren were. This is the most dominant we've seen McLaren since maybe the odd race in 2012 that they won. And there was a race, I think, at Spa in 2012 that they won by 20 seconds, probably the first time since then, that McLaren have looked dominant ahead of the rest of the field. Quite an incredible sight. Um, and yeah, the, the amount of, you know, uh, lap time they were showing compared to Red Bull after Lando started to pull ahead of Max, you know, he was pulling ahead by... At times, nearly a second per lap compared to Verstappen. It was incredible to see Red Bull getting treated like they had treated everyone else for the last couple of years. Uh, just bullying the opposition, really. Um, and then, yeah, Lando, after probably, say, four or five laps of being in the lead, Lando had won the race at that point because even with Max pitting before Lando... As long as McLaren did a good pit stop, which they did, McLaren were never going to lose that Grand Prix. They were way too quick for Red Bull and Verstappen. So congratulations to McLaren and Lando. As I'll get into later, I don't think Lando was the driver of the day, but definitely was one of the drivers of the day. There is no doubt about that. And I'd say Lando was probably, I think, quite comfortably the driver of the weekend. I think we can absolutely say that. For Oscar Piastri, though, Lando's teammate, just a poor weekend, really, for him. Um, qualifying up until that last lap in Q3 was looking good for him. Was looking like he was probably going to be on the front row of the grid with his teammate. And then, really, since that final lap in Q3, where Oscar... Just didn't get it together, had a poor middle and final sector and ended up third when he really should have been qualifying second and making it a McLaren front row. Ever since then, it just, you know, his weekend unraveled. In the race, he also had a bad start and lost position to George Russell. Got stuck behind Russell, did get very close to him in the early laps and then he dropped back, I think, because he probably went a bit too hard on his tyres. And then progressively started to drop back from Russell and Leclerc in the Ferrari was really stuck right behind him for the rest of the first stint. Then Ferrari did an undercut, very successful undercut, getting themselves past Russell and of course Piastri who went very long into the Grand Prix. Piastri pitted I think on lap 32 or 33 um, and I think that was the right decision by the way from McLaren. They That first stint, them going as long as they did, was a good decision because it was going to give them very fast, fresh tyres for the second half of the race. And given the McLaren's pace that they were showing with Lando in clean air, on fresher tyres, that McLaren, we knew, was going to be very quick. And when Oscar came out for his pit stop, he was very quick, passing um, George Russell. Very good move, by the way, around the outside of Turn 1. And then quickly got up to the back of Leclerc, and I thought, he was going to pass Leclerc pretty easily because I thought, you know, the McLaren is way quicker than the Ferrari. But I have to give credit to Leclerc. Really drove well when Piastri got to the back of him. Put in, you have to say, probably qualifying laps in terms of, um, you know, the quality of the laps he did when Oscar got up to the back of him because it had to be that good if Leclerc was going to stay ahead. Because Oscar, in that McLaren, was doing some of the fastest laps in the Grand Prix. And then Oscar burnt his tyres out a bit, lost a bit of confidence, lost a bit of hope. And then Leclerc started to pull away. And I think in the end, it ended up being like a second, uh, the gap between the two. And Oscar ended up finishing in fourth place. You may, you know, complain that maybe the strategy should have been better for Oscar. But I think the strategy that they put him on, given that... He was out of position, really, for how quick the McLaren car was. I think the strategy they put him on was 
a, a very good strategy, uh, the best strategy. And I think if Piastri was actually performing to his best level, I think Piastri would have delivered. And may have even, if he had got past Leclerc, you know, uh, let's say when he got up to the back of him, if he had got past him in a couple laps... He could have even got after Max Verstappen and maybe even finished in second place. So, you know, he finished fourth, but there was a lot more on offer for Piastri had he actually got past Leclerc and delivered what was clearly there to be delivered in that McLaren car. So, you know, great weekend for McLaren, dominant pole, dominant race win, but it should have been a 1-2, no doubt about it, and Piastri... Just didn't perform well enough, I'm afraid. But congrats to McLaren. They are, uh, what is it, 31 points, I think, now behind Red Bull. And soon, not yet, but soon, they are going to pass Red Bull in the championship. I don't think it will be in the next three races. I think it will probably be in um, either the US or Mexico Grand Prix, maybe even the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. Because I don't think McLaren are going to be this consistently quick every race until the end of the season. Because we do have some different types of tracks coming up. For example, this weekend, Monza, the highest speed track on the calendar. And it's all about straight line speed, really, at Monza. So it's not going to be as easy to catch and pass Red Bull as people think. But I think at the rate that McLaren are, you know... Um, scoring points, I think eventually it will happen before the end of the season, unless Sergio Perez um, puts in some better performances. Uh, talking to Sergio Perez, let's go on to Red Bull. And with Perez and Verstappen, I don't think you can complain at all about their performances. The Red Bull car simply wasn't good enough. The understeer, I have to say, in Max's car especially, was horrendous we saw it at times on board um at turn 10 that like uh i wouldn't say hairpin like corner but a corner that is quite slow and you do need a front end a good front end for that corner but max didn't have that um and that was costing him probably two or three tenths a lap alone in that corner um but we've seen in the last few races and max has complained about it the front end of the red bull just isn't working for him and the reason Max isn't doing as well because of that is because Max likes a car that's very pointy. You know, the front end is really sharp and it really goes into the you know, corner aggressively. This Red Bull car is not doing that. We saw it again back in Hungary where it was understeering all over the place in the slow corners. We saw it, you know, at Zandvoort. And if it keeps doing that, then we're not going to see maybe the best Max Verstappen because it isn't suiting absolutely how he likes a car to handle. Uh, but I think Max did the best he could this weekend. You know, qualifying and finishing in second was actually slightly better, I think, than what, you know, really it should have been for Red Bull because, like I said, Piastri really should have been qualifying and finishing in second, but it was Max who was doing that. Um, you know, luckily for Max, you know, Lando, despite winning by a massive margin, Lando has only gained eight points on Max. So it's not like he's gained, you know, uh, 15 or 20 points on Max. So the gap is still, at the minute, comfortable for Verstappen. But with how quick McLaren are at the minute, that gap is progressively going to come down. Whether it will come down enough for Lando to win the championship, who knows. But it's going to get closer and closer as the season rolls on. There is no doubt about that. But um, I have to just say a couple of things of Red Bull. Sergio Perez, again, I don't think anyone should be complaining about his performance. Yes, it was sixth place, but he was only 17 or 18 seconds behind Max at the end of the race. And to be honest... At best, that's what you would expect of Perez to be about 15 to 20 seconds behind Max. So, I don't think we can really sit here and say, oh, Perez was awful. He was, you know, nowhere near, um, you, know, you know, he wasn't fighting the drivers he should fight. I think he did absolutely fine. Uh, the Red Bull car just isn't good enough. It, it really is not good enough. 
Um, so yeah, I don't think we can moan about Perez's performance, but of course, McLaren beating them, you know, beating Red Bull as badly as they did will send off alarm bells at Red Bull because there are a few tracks remaining on the calendar where, you know, it's going to be a high or medium aerodynamic, uh, you know, type circuit in terms of what, you know, it requires from the cars to be quick. Obviously, you know, tracks like Singapore, uh, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, uh, the Circuit of the Americas, um, you know, tracks like that. But I will say for Red Bull, and, you know, if you're a Max Verstappen fan as well, I still don't think you need to be massively concerned or massively in a panic i would say at the moment especially if you're a max verstappen fan because even though yes there are a few tracks remaining on the calendar where mclaren are going to be quicker than red bull again singapore uh texas qatar abu dhabi places like that there are other grand prix as well where the you know they're not going to suit McLaren as much as you know the Zandvoort track does. For example, this weekend at Monza is, except for a couple corners, it's all about straight line speed, and McLaren are not exactly great at that. So you know this weekend is really a crucial race for Red Bull and Verstappen to take advantage of that weakness. In the McLaren, and we still know the Red Bull in a straight line is, you know, is very efficient, and the engine is good. So, like I said, they need to take advantage of that. But then, you know, you've got Baku, another track where you can't exactly say it's, you know, uh, the aero is very important there. Um, obviously, you've got, you know, the Sao Paulo Grand Prix as well. So. Even though maybe McLaren for most of the races remaining will be quicker than Red Bull, it's not going to be like that, I don't think, at every single Grand Prix. And there will be races where Red Bull will have the chance to beat McLaren. And they just need to make sure that when those races come, that they actually beat McLaren. For example, this weekend. If Max Verstappen is going to win the championship then really he needs to at least beat Lando Norris this weekend. But really, I'd say win the Italian Grand Prix. If he can do that and McLaren, you know, finish second with Lando or third, then that puts Max still in a, in a comfortable position going forward for the remaining races. But if Red Bull don't take advantage of those races where, again, Aero is not going to be really that important. Then they need to start worrying big time about the championships. But again, if you're a Max fan, don't panic too much. Because like I said, this weekend at Monza, I don't think McLaren are going to have the best car. Because you know, when it comes to straight line speed, that's not a, a thing McLaren are super great at. And... It's going to be a very competitive weekend. You know, Red Bull and Ferrari I expect to be very quick, especially Ferrari in the race, given how, and we'll get onto in a moment, how good Ferrari's race pace is. Um, and McLaren, if they're going to win, they're really going to have to have a super great weekend because it's going to be a much more competitive weekend than what they've you know had in Zandvoort where they've just absolutely dominated. So, yeah. It's going to be interesting, these remaining races, but I think in terms of the Drivers' Championship, I still think Max is, you know, clearly the favourite. Lando will close the gap, but as long as Max remains consistent and Red Bull don't make any massive mistakes, they should be fine. Constructors' Championship-wise, I don't think they will be fine. I think McLaren will win that. But for the driver's title, I think they should just about be okay as long as they, you know, remain consistent and don't make any massive mistakes. But we'll see how that goes. And it'd be very interesting to see how uh, or where McLaren are compared to Red Bull this weekend at Monza. And maybe this weekend will be McLaren's weakest Grand Prix. It was last year. Um, and Red Bull 
really. We'll be hoping that's the case this year. So, yeah, we will see. Uh, but let's go on to the Scuderia Ferrari team who had a very up and down weekend. Friday, they were in the gutter, were this team. They looked like they were barely able to get in the top 10, um, even with just one car, never mind both cars. When qualifying came, they ended up 6th and 11th, and really, given Carlos Sainz didn't do a lot of running on Friday because he had a gearbox problem, that was really the best Ferrari could do. Uh, they couldn't really do any better than that. So you have to say the two drivers, you can't really blame them for what happened on Saturday. But on Sunday, what a performance by both drivers. And it wasn't all down to the drivers. The pace of the Ferrari car genuinely was a lot better. I think the weather conditions did help that because it was uh, bone dry all day. And it wasn't uh, slippery uh, the track, which I don't think helped Ferrari in the earlier parts of the weekend. But Charles Leclerc finishing in third is my driver of the day for the Dutch Grand Prix. Because, you know, starting in, what was it, sixth place, I believe. He had a good start, got behind Oscar Piastri. And at the start, I thought, right, Leclerc's probably going to drop off. And, you know, he's going to be under pressure from Sergio Perez, probably for the rest of the first stint or the race but then suddenly he closed in on Piastri and started to pressurize him and was hanging on very well and then Ferrari great decision went for the undercut and the most surprising thing is not only well it wasn't surprising that they uh, ended up jumping Russell who at the time was in third place because you know the undercut is very powerful in Formula One um, especially at Zandvoort but um Leclerc, despite having one lap older tyres, you know, he only came out like a second clear of Russell, but then ended up pulling away by a few seconds. So, very impressive pace from Ferrari, especially in the second half of the Grand Prix, to be clearly quicker than Mercedes, who, for the first two days of the race weekend, looked miles clear of them. Um, so, you're very impressed by that. And then, when Piastri, in the second half of the race, got up behind Leclerc, I was so impressed with Leclerc's performance. Like I said, he put in laps that were really qualifying laps to keep himself ahead and far enough ahead that Oscar couldn't go for a move. And then Oscar eventually lost confidence, burnt his tyres out, and Leclerc was actually, in those final 20 laps or so, he was lapping at the same speed, if not going quicker, than Max Verstappen, and if you look at the uh, the race time from earlier on in this podcast, when I uh, you know showed the gaps between the cars, Leclerc didn't finish that far behind Max. It was only what was it five or six seconds. So for me, you know, if you're a Ferrari fan, you know, going into this weekend's Grand Prix at Monza, that is you know going to suit Ferrari way more. Because obviously Ferrari's power unit is super strong. And obviously it is a very high speed circuit. I think it's like 80% of the track is flat out. If Ferrari can just have a bit of a better qualifying. Then you know if they can show similar strong race pace. Ferrari really could be in for something special this weekend. So if you're a Ferrari fan I would be quietly confident about this weekend's race at Monza. Again, as long as Ferrari deliver in qualifying. It doesn't have to be pole position necessarily, but if they can get, say, both cars in the top five, you never know. You never know what could happen in the race. But yeah, Leclerc, brilliant pace. Ferrari, brilliant pace uh, in the race as well. Carlos Sainz really performed well as well, finishing in fifth and not that far off the podium considering he started back in P10. Uh, 25 points scored for Ferrari, which I did not think was possible whatsoever for them to score that amount of points, uh, you know, this Dutch Grand Prix weekend. But they did. Um, and they scored, what was it, almost the same amount of points that Red Bull did. And remember, you know, McLaren obviously catching Red Bull in the championship. But Ferrari also are not a million miles away from Red Bull. So, you know, Ferrari are still... Looking good on the constructors' end. We are very impressed by Ferrari and Leclerc. Considering 
just how bad the Ferrari car was looking, um, you know, in the first couple of days of the of the weekend and where he ended up starting the race from. I think, yeah, Leclerc, driver of the day. What a performance. That was one of his best performances of the year and one of the probably best performances we've seen from him in the last year and a half, I would say. Uh, that was, yeah, top Leclerc performance. And you have to say, last two or three races, he has been at his very, very best, which is good to see. And uh, he still holds on to third in the championship. Um, but let's quickly go on to Mercedes-Benz. There's not really much to say about them. Um, on Friday, they looked really good, especially in that middle sector. I thought they were going to be definitely contenders for at least the podium but definitely the win but once qualifying came it was false hope they didn't have the pace for pole position they were nowhere near getting on pole position um and then in the race i mean russell had a good start good first stint but after that first pit stop where he lost position to leclerc mercedes just didn't have any pace um and russell just continuously fell away got passed by piastri was about to be passed by Carlos Sainz and then pitted for the second time and that's why Russell ended up in seventh. Lewis Hamilton finished in eighth. That was the best he could do given, you know, where he was starting from, which I think was, was it 14th or 13th, something like that, after his grid penalty. Um, And given the pace of the Mercedes car, which wasn't that good in the race, like I said, that was the best he was going to do in the race. But yeah, very disappointing weekend. I thought Mercedes, even coming into the weekend, would be at least strong podium contenders. But for them to be 7th and 8th, I know, you know, both cars pitted uh, an extra time. But Russell wasn't going to head for any great result, even if he had uh, not pitted for a second time it's just yeah very disappointing i'm hoping it's a one-off we'll see how they perform this weekend at monza the last time we raced at a power track was the red bull ring um in austria and there mercedes were what third quickest behind red bull and mclaren obviously ended up winning it but that was because obviously max and lando crashed into each other um so yeah not expecting anything that great this weekend maybe a fourth or a fifth could be possible in the race at monza but yeah i'd be very surprised if they're fighting for the race win but you never know maybe they'll have a very good package especially with low downforce wings um so yeah those are the top teams uh pierre gasly i have to shout out what a performance by him finishing in ninth place and beating the aston martin of fernando alonso uh, Alonso, not a great race by him, finishing in 10th, but I don't think that was necessarily his fault. Um, a shame for Alex Albon that he got disqualified in qualifying for a technical infringement because his qualifying performance was so good. But even though Williams had that disqualification, I hope they don't get too down on themselves because the upgrade package they brought to the car clearly worked because they were way quicker than we expected and if they can keep showing that pace for the rest of the year then Alex Albon I think can have probably a very good end to the 2024 season um I thought Haas with Holkenberg did pretty well I think Holkenberg finished in 11th place so yeah he had a, a good performance but uh yeah not really much else from the midfield and yeah the Dutch Grand Prix was was decent it was Probably the best, like I said earlier, that it, it could have been. Um, it's never going to be a, a classic Dutch... You're never going to have a classic Dutch Grand Prix because, again, these cars are too wide. When Formula 1 was racing at this track in the 80s, the cars were way smaller. And that's why the racing at, at this track was a lot better. So, yeah. Um, you know, after 2026, I think we could see some, uh, you know, quite a bit better races at this track given that the cars, I think, are slimming down and will weigh less. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what it's like after them. But with these cars, that race you got is the best that you're going to get, I'm afraid. Um, but, yeah, there you go. That is your Dutch Grand Prix review. Thank you guys for coming along. Make sure to comment in the comment section down below what you thought of the Dutch Grand Prix and what I had to, uh, you know, say what my... Uh, 
my takes were. And, you know, let me know what you thought of the driver and team performances, especially for the top teams. Do you think certain drivers could have performed better that I think, you know, did all right? Or, you know, just in general, what did you think of the performances we saw in the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort? Remember, this weekend, I will be live for both qualifying and the race. Qualifying, I will be uh, going live at 1.30pm UK time. An hour and a half build up as usual for qualifying, which starts at 3pm UK time. So yeah, I'll be live on Saturday, 1.30pm UK time till about 4.30pm. And then on Sunday, I will be live as usual with my co-commentator Niblo. Two hours before the race starts at 12pm UK time until... Obviously, a few minutes after the race, probably 3.30pm or 4pm UK time, depending on, of course, when the race finishes. And then, of course, this time next week, there'll be a review, of course, of the Italian Grand Prix. But, uh, yeah, make sure to join me for that this weekend. Make sure to smash the like button before you go. It does help the channel grow in the algorithm and uh, help show me that you guys do enjoy the content. But, guys... That's it for my Dutch Grand Prix review and until my next bis, uh, bit of content on Saturday where I'll be live for what's going to be a very exciting qualifying at the Temple of Speed at Monza. It has been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye.